Verse chapter 2, and we will um, tag verse 5 as our focus for today. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Today we're starting a new series that we want to title, One of Us. Right. One of Us. You may take your seat. One of Us. So maybe you're here today and you're not honestly a believer. You came because your auntie or maybe your girlfriend invited you and you didn't know how to turn them down or maybe you do have an interest in the faith, but sometimes you are turned off. Sadly, you're not turned off by the sinner. It's turned off by the saint. And we want to consider this idea. What does it mean and what does it look like to be one of us? When I say one of us, I'm not specifically talking about the city church. When I say one of us, I'm not specifically talking about one of those people who get up early on Sunday morning and go to church and fuss on the way. And don't speak to one another when you get out. I'm not talking about that either. I'm talking about a group of those that we would like to call the called out ones. Those that are a little more pure and authentic in their faith with an expected end in mind. This is not just tradition. This is the way in which I view the entire world. I'm really trying to be really academic here, but I feel like you're making me go ghetto before I really want it to. Somebody really needs to know the only reason that I ain't really got back at you yet is because of Jesus. Now my old self would have snapped off at you and it would have, we would have done what it do. But if it wasn't for the grace and the hand of God on my life, not only did he do something to my heart, but he helped to transform my mind the way that I think about things. And one of the reasons I don't have that heart of get back anymore, because I know you ain't in control anyway. You're just playing a part. So if God allowed it, it means he's, he must have a plan to use it. And all things are going to work together for my good. All right? So, so watch this. Today's conversation is going to consist of practical kingdom principles to grab a hold of and radically change and transform your life. What does this mean to us, to um, those of you who are visiting with us today, our VIPs? Uh, uh, we want to communicate this idea of culture. And to the city church, we are going on 10 years. January is 10 years. Make some noise for that. All right? Last Sunday in January, we're going to be worshiping in Jamaica. So I want y'all to get ready for that. We're going to, y'all are like, what? <laughs> we doing what? <laughs> All right. Miss Jackie's paying for everybody. Don't worry about nothing. Don't worry about nothing. Overflow is going to hit her house. All right. And so uh, when, when we talk about this idea, we, we create this thing called culture. Everyone say culture. The reality is culture happens by default or by design. Culture happens by default or by design. So because culture is going to be created, whether you participate or not, then it would behoove you to create culture. Because it's going to happen by default or by design, it would behoove you to create the culture that you want to see. So in our house, there's a certain culture. We love God. We love people, we love family, and we give generously. Amen. This is the culture for our house. So what does that mean? Before we go over to 1309 Grantham in just a couple months and, and, and the floodgates open up and people start coming from everywhere, it's important that we would have already established culture. Otherwise, we may be overtaken and culture begins to define itself by default. Everyone with me? Yeah. This isn't new to us. We're just taking an opportunity to remix it. So culture is a movement of a generation. Here at the city, we know that culture happens again by default or design. So rather allowing our feelings, our upbringing, or society's standards to take the lead, 
Our goal is to intentionally and consistently create the culture we want to see. So there are three responses to culture. I'll give them to you quickly. Three responses to culture. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the person beside you. Response number one, complain. Yeah, this is their part. Response to culture number one, complain. You don't want to change nothing. You just want to talk about everything. Just complain. Number two, conform. All right? Because ultimately, either a room and atmosphere, either you're going to change it or it's going to change you. So for some of us, we complain. For some of us, we conform. For the city church, we want to confront culture. We want to engage it. We're not going to sit back and just talk about it and say we're going to go back in our corners of do nothing and separate ourselves because we don't want to be inundated with this flu called sin. Anything that's not done in church in some people's eyes is sin, and that's not the case. I believe that the happiest people should be believers. The happiest marriages should, should come from two people who know Jesus, who have lowered their self and made a commitment to serve selflessly. I believe that's the beauty of our faith. So why is that important for us? To engage culture around you genuinely, consistently, intentionally, and to impact change within it. So let's consider this. Never. Someone say never. Say it with your chest. Never. Never. Never underestimate the power of your everyday platform. Especially in the African-American context. Everybody wants to get a collar and everybody wants to preach. Do you know how fast I would let you have my spot? I could be at the Cowboys game today, but I'm here with you. I want to see the Cowboys so bad, but they always play on Sunday, so I got to be here with you. Hmm? You can have it. Huh? Everybody want this. You don't want this smoke. <laughs> Why is this important? Because you have a platform that's more impactful than the one God's given me. I can't go in your job and have an open opportunity to share Christ, or if I'm not sharing Christ, I can be him. Because sometimes it's not in what you say, it's what you do. You don't always have to say it, just be it, and they will say it. There's something different about you. Well, let me tell you about a man named Jesus. Watch this. Never underestimate the power of your platform. You have influence in other circles that I cannot reach. So take this language, remix it, make your own song and play it through the course of your week and let God minister to others through you as a vessel. Are you with me? So let's consider Saul. Saul, who later becomes transformed, his name known as Paul, who writes a great majority of our Bible, practically all of the New Testament. He has an encounter with God on the Damascus Road. And following, he hangs close to home for a period. He comes to know Jesus. He is called as a minister. And he doesn't go as a missionary across to other countries. He goes right back home. And he makes a difference in his home. He confronts the norms on his everyday platforms, which is our present day marketplace. So everybody wants to minister and we relegate ministry only to Sunday. But you have way more opportunity to minister six days a week in your marketplace. And you don't got to be spooky about it. One, one, of, one of the ladies, she do hair. She said, pa, I just want to treat you, Pastor. I, just, I said, so what are you talking about? I need a blowout? I don't think that's what I'm going to be doing. No, I'm just going to give you a nice wash, and I'm going to reinvigorate your scalp. No, I was like, that sounds like God to me. And, 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 I, and I went, and she didn't talk, and I ain't talk. We ain't have no conversation. But there was a presence in that room. There was a presence in that room. That Lord, for everybody who comes in this room, not only will their hair be changed, but their hearts are going to be changed because the presence of the Holy One is there. And if you are a truck driver, then the presence of God should be on your truck. If you are a school teacher, then the presence of God... I felt a school teacher say, you pushing it, Pastor. It's only, it's only week two. 
It's only, you asking too much. It's, a, it's only week two. Wherever you are, there ought to be a presence on your life for whatever it is that you do. You have been strategically positioned within your marketplace. You have been strategically positioned in your marketplace. When you go to a new job, the first thing you should not think about is how much more am I going to get paid? Come on, uh -oh. Now, it should be 1.2. Yeah. Maybe not 1.1. 1.1 should be whose life is about to be changed because I just got transitioned to this new department. All this fussing about to stop and ain't cussing nobody out. Not after the second day, <laughs> you know, days one through two, God give me grace. You know, after, on the third day, everything got to be made new, all right? You understand? So when God strategically positions you a place, he does it for a reason. Somebody say, I got a reason. Paul lived out his principles personally, then wrote letters to other churches, one of which we'll focus on today in the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians, which could also be considered resources through suffering. So if you want to read the book of Philippians through the course of this week, consider this thought, resources through suffering. Why is that important? Because this book is about Christ in our life, yes. Christ in our mind, yes. Christ as our goal, Christ as our strength, our joy through suffering. It is a prison epistle. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah. Paul writes to us about changing our hearts and our minds, being joyful in our suffering while he was in prison. All right? So this validates and qualifies him to be our focused thought leader for today, yeah. that even as a prisoner, he encourages us through his letter and to, to walk in joy. In the book of Philippians, he communicates being joyful over 10 times yeah, yeah. while locked up yeah, yeah. with no money on his canteen. Jesus. <laughs> Philippians communicates the right Christian experience is the outworking, whatever our circumstances may be, of life, of nature, and of the mind of Christ living in us. John 13, 35 says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. For those of you who are visiting with us today, that you should have experienced that love when you walked in the room. When you hit the parking lot, something different about this place. This ain't no game and it doesn't happen on accident. This is the culture that we have created. So what happens if you are intentional about creating a light culture on your job? in your home or in your relationship. It's not just about creating business and or industry, but even if you're a husband and a wife, you ought to have conversation today. So what is going to be our culture? So let's start first that when you talk to me, I need you to lower your tone because you remind me of where I come from and I don't want to put my hands on you, but when people used to talk to me like that, it used to go down and to go down. So we, we got a, I got a witness in the room that this is what I came here for, marriage maintenance, <laughs> all right? And, and so you got to create this culture, even, it, oh, Jesus, even, even with your children. Yeah, let me, let me come another way. Even with your children, you have to create this culture. Some of us got to be intentional about recreating a new culture because you have recreated a culture you didn't like. You are parenting your children the same way your parents parented you and you wanted to run away. So you got to really think, if this didn't help me, how is it going to help them? So recreate and be more intentional about a culture. So are you parenting in faith or fear? So do your children respond because they believe in you or they respond because they know you crazy? If you are parenting out of a place of fear, you are parenting out of manipulation. And the Bible says manipulation is witchcraft. So if Jesus parents you out of love and not fear, then how much more should you parent your children out of love? Yes. Wow. Yes. 
Love requires conversations. So watch this. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Are we, are we all right so far? But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things there is no law. Let me give you this to you in Eugene Peterson's message translation. Just listen. But what happens when we live God's way? I am having this conversation with you today not because I am trying to establish or recreate a culture in this house. I'm trying to get you to go home and create a culture in your house. Why is that important? Because despite what you think about God and think about the faith, God's way is better. Argue in the comments. God's way is just better. PT, I don't know. It's you Christian folk. No, no, no. Be careful. Don't say you Christian folks when you're talking about them. Call them by their name. Them Christian folks, they got it. But I'm going to give you a fresh, why is this important? If I lived out my life saying I'm not going to be a Christian because I didn't like the models in front of me, then what good would that be? The reason I am a Christian is because I didn't like the models in front of me. And I decided there's another generation that's coming that's got to see better than what I saw. It's one of the reasons I don't do it my way. I do it God's way. And I'm not knocking your way. I just want to do it better God's way. I don't believe God's way requires me to wear a, a three-piece corduroy suit every Sunday morning when I got on Hanes and Dickies every, and, and, and a polo work shirt every other work day of the week. I don't believe that's God's choice. I, I don't believe that's his best. To be honest, I don't believe he cares. Come on, come on. Okay. So what do we wear when you come to your church? Where, what you feel? What do you feel? Not too tight, not too revealing. You good. I see. How you choose what you wear? What I feel. When I feel really churchy, I put on a suit. When I'm tired, I just, I'm just getting there. I'm just going to get there. I'm just getting, I'm just, I'm just. I'm, I'm, I'm here. The Bible says he brings gifts into our lives much the same way the fruit appears in the orchard. Things like affection for others. As a believer, this is, this is the fruit you should see coming off of our lives. Not speaking in tongues at the drive through in the McDonald's. How, how can I place your order? So is that with onions or not? I, I, need, a, I need a translator. Now, that is not to knock the gift of tongues. It has its value and its importance, but there is a time, a place, and a season for all things. And because we lack security in who we are, we leave these buildings trying to overcome and, and, and over-inundate ourselves to prove who we are. It is 107 degrees outside. Why are you going to the restaurant with your choir robe on? Take that off. We're not asking you to give us a selection at the buffet. Take it off. You're hot. You're sweating. I can see it. <laughs> and the reason they still have it on is because it's so hot they didn't wear anything underneath. And you brought your nasty self in this restaurant. Talk about who got some baby powder. You need more than baby powder. You need some undergarments. Some spanks. Now. <laughs> Welcome to the city church. I don't even know where I stopped, so let me move on. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 through 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Tell somebody it ain't about you. It's not about you. you. This oneness and this unity you felt when you came in the room doing worship today, you know why you felt that? Because we have already had a conversation. We're not singing your favorite songs. No Mississippi Mass today. 
It's not going to happen. Today, you are not the target. Today ain't about you. It is about Jesus, and it is about our guests, and it is about God speaking to their heart. And what happens when, as believers, we all make a commitment? It ain't about you. But some of you who are married, your sex will be better. Kid City over there. If you stop going into every worship experience thinking it's about you. I just gave you the message translation. Did you? I hope you caught it. I hope you caught it. Count others as more significant than yourselves. What does that mean? When I know it's not about me, this is what it means. It means I should enjoy the journey above the destination. I'm just enjoying the journey. Today hasn't gone everything just the way we planned it. Things going on behind the scenes you have no. Why is that important? It's not important. I'm enjoying the journey. I'm just enjoying the journey. The, the, the fact that all of y'all are flooded in here on a Sunday like this, I'm enjoying the journey. All right? So watch this. Philippians 4, verses 11 through 13. I am not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be con. Tent. It's difficult for you to enjoy the journey until you're able to live a lifestyle of contentment. He says, I have learned to be content. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Somebody say, teach me how to be content. Life has a way of teaching you how to be content. You know what? For some of you, lift your hands. You want money coming to you now. Raise it. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking, Lord, give them money out of the yin yang now. Now put your hands down. The only reason I want God to give you this money so you can realize the money was never going to meet your need. The money was never the answer anyway. And until you are happy with you and learn to work on you, there is no Cambodian weave that you can pay enough money for and hang from your head when your mind ain't right. Your mind is in torment. You have conflict and lack peace in your heart. But somebody say, when peace like a river attendeth my way and sorrow like sea billow row, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well. That means I'm content. I'm good. If you with me or if you leave me, I'm good. With the money or without it, I'm good. With the building or without it, for 10 years I proved I'm good. You got to learn how to be content. If God answers your most passionate prayer, for many of us, it will kill you. It will choke the life out of you because you don't just want it. You want it for what it's going to do for you. You got an ego problem, an insecurity issue, and I just want it so it can make me look big. Only small people need things to make them feel bigger. Say, Lord, work on me. So that when I get what I've been praying for, I can actually enjoy it. Lord, work on me. So when you introduce me to the man or the woman of my dreams, I don't destroy it. Lord, work on me. So that when I come into the money I've been believing you for, it doesn't consume me. Work on me. Somebody say, work on me. All right, sit down for just a second. Why, why is this important? Teach me how to be content. Someone say content. The, the problem is we have been overcome with this lie that manage your now because your next is going to be better. That's not the gospel of contentment. If you're going to be content, it means your now and your next are equal. Why? Because the blessing of my next wasn't contingent upon what God gave me. The blessing of my next always hinged upon, is he going to be there? And if he's there then, and if he's here now, then I'm going to be good. It don't matter where you take me. Why is this important? Tell somebody I'm good. With the job or without the job, I'm good. With the man or without the man, I'm good. 
with the money or without the money, I'm good. Why? Because you are with me. I'm good. What, what, what does that mean? The fact that he is with you now, that means here is holy. It means where you are right now is holy. It is separated. It is consecrated. It is the purpose place. Your next is not going to be greater. Here is where God wants you. Here is holy. Why is that important? He says, I, I need you to learn how to be content. He says, I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Context is everything. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Um, he then says, verse 13, I can do all things. I don't, know if you, I don't know if you ever caught that in context. He says, whether I got it or I don't, whether I'm good or I'm not, whether I have plenty or I have lack, what I have learned is I can do all things through Christ Jesus, which gives me strength. Meaning, it was never about what you got. It was knowing before you got it who it came from. So before I get it, God, I'm going to go ahead and tell everybody, God did it. God did it. Before I get the house, God did it. Before I get the car, God did it. Before I get the raise, God did it. Before we move into 1309, God did it. God did it. He says, I can do all things through Christ, all right? All right, we're doing good on time. Here we go. Here we go. Watch this. Can I, can I tag? Can I tag a text from my brother Job? Because Job said in chapter 23, verse 10, but he knows the way that I take. And when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. Now, this did something to me. And it wasn't, even, it wasn't even the part about coming forth as gold. It was the security and knowing that he knows the way that I take. I don't know if that means anything to you. Why is this important? He knows your journey. And he knows and has already planned for you to make it through this. Here's what you need to know. Because of your value to him, he knows where you are. He knows why you're there. And he knows your limits. All right? That's the uh, that's King James Version. Here's the PTV translation. All right? So everybody under my roof who has a cell phone has to share their location with me at all times. Number one, my wife has to do it because she doesn't pick up her phone like she should. So when I call and she don't answer, I can just look and tell. So, 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 so when I finally talk to her and say, babe, where you at? I'm on my way. No, no, just tell me where you at. I'm on my, no, just, where you at? I'm at TJ Maxx. I'm at T, okay? I'm at T, okay? <laughs> I'm at TJ Maxx. You caught me, all right? Everyone under, uh, under my roof has to share their location with me at all times. Christian, he goes to school. He's got to share his location with me at all times. Why? Because of their value to my life. Because of their value to my life, I need to know where they are at all times. Why is that important? <laughs> because if they ever get in trouble, and call me for help. I don't have to ask, where are you? Because I knew the way that you took. And God told me to tell somebody today, despite how it feels and despite your pain, I know the way that you take. You're just one ass from me showing up and showing out. I know the way that you take. Watch this. He says... For he knows, he knows, his way is better. I believe with my whole heart, his way is better. It's more than just fire insurance, but loving God makes me a better husband. 
It makes me a better father. It makes me a better friend. It's better. Watch this. I'm going to shout. Oh, man, we're doing really good today. All right. All right. Um, so watch this. I want you to go with me for a minute. Just watch it on the screen. It's all good. I ain't mad at you. Um, we're going to jump real fast. Um, it's, it's Welcome Home Sunday, right? I had, I had, it just was right there. I had to at least tag my boy, um, my, my, my boy in Luke 15, the prodigal. The Bible says in Luke 15, verse 12, the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. This is the, 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 the uh, this isn't even a real story, but Jesus was so cold in his stories that when we read them, he gives them in such a way that we, it feels like it was real. These weren't even real characters. He was, he was making an illustration to get his point across, to give clear understanding, a bit of a parable. And, 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 and it's so good, we think it's real. So he says, there are these, there's this father who has two sons. And the younger son comes and says, Father, I want you to give me my part of the state now. Whatever you have for me in your will, I don't want to wait for you to die. Just give it to me right now. And the father says, fine, you know, I'm going to give it to you. He divides it up. He gives it to the son. Jump me, verse 13. Not long after, his son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in, in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the, in the whole country, and he began to be in need. Why is this important? Because you got to be careful how God communicates to people. Because for some of us, he communicates to them differently. Here's what you got to note relative to this passage, is he didn't take his credit card, go to Vegas, and in one night, all his money's gone, and calls his dad the next morning. For some of you, this is an example, modern example, of your children. It's not an overnight experience. Sometimes it can be two years. Sometimes it can be five years. Sometimes it can be 12 years. Sometimes it can be 20 years. You just got to know, even when they escape your hand, they never escape his divine radar. Because even still, God knows the way that... They take. How, how do you know that God knows the way that they take? This is what the Bible says in verse 15. So he went and hired himself out. He spent everything. Everything's gone. So now he, he can't live off his inheritance anymore. He goes as a citizen of the country, sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave. It was so bad for him that he wanted to eat what he was feeding the animals with. Sometimes life will break you down in such a way that you will have a longing for what you used to detest. Be careful saying what you would never do. I don't plan to do it, but if life gets deep enough, I just might have to do it. Be careful saying what you will never do. Watch this. This is what the Bible says. <clears throat> he longed to fill his stomach with the pods uh, that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Verse 7, and when he came to his senses, he left his father's house. You know the end of the story. And he comes back home. But he didn't come back home because his father went after him. He came back home because there was a message in the mud. We're so quick to throw dirt on those who are living muddy lives. But sometimes God's got to get you in the mud so you can understand the message that he put in it for you. He wouldn't have got this message spending his father's money. He wouldn't have got this message living up high. Sometimes God's got to let you hit rock bottom so you can read the message in the mud. The Bible says he came to his senses. Where did he come to his senses? It wasn't in church. It wasn't at a revival. He came to his senses in the mud. You can't give up on people because they muddy today. A miracle can be birthed in the mud if you keep mm, mm. Jesus. Why do I keep doing this for? Um, 
because there was one, there was one man who was blind and went to Jesus for healing. And he thought Jesus was going to speak a word, Akuna Matata, be healed. He, he, he thought Jesus was going to blow over his eyes. Jesus got down and started playing in the mud. And he took the mud and put it on the man's eyes. Why? Because there was a miracle that came through the mud. And in this season, somebody's got to embrace the fact that I'm believing that God is going to work a miracle even in the mud of my life. I'm believing that God's going to do exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or think, even in the mud. Watch this. He says, uh, he says when he came to his senses, he came, he, he came, uh, you know what? Sakethia, this is, this is why I don't like live church. I like virtual church. I like online church because online church keeps it 100. Because when I was talking about the message in the mud, they try to act like I won't talk about them. But they the same ones talk about I was sinking deep in sin. I'm sorry though. What were you sinking in? Yeah, he came and found you in the muddy seasons of your life and before your mess overcame you, he reached down and grabbed you. And I'm believing today that somebody came tipping in in the muddy seasons of their life. But just like he found me and just like he found you and just like he found you, I'm believing he's going to find somebody. Watch this. Somebody say, welcome home. Welcome home. He, he's, he's practicing his speech. When, when I, all right, this is, I came to my senses. This is what I learned. I'm learned, um, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, William McDowell, but I must go back. Uh, yes, I'm going back because I had it better in my father's house. He said, I'm going to go back to my father and I'm going to say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of, he's practicing this speech. Because if I come in a level of shame and lowliness, then maybe he'll receive me. So he got up, the Bible says, verse 20, went to his father. But while he was way off, mm, while he was way off, God, this is so good. Somebody say, welcome home. Because about 10 weeks ago, I sat with our staff and I said, ladies and gentlemen, we need to do something. They're like, what are we going to do? I said, we're going to do a welcome home Sunday. What is a welcome home Sunday? Don't worry about it. Just, just follow my lead. <laughs> Somebody inboxed me the other day. That's why I don't like y'all new age churches. Welcome home Sunday ain't nothing but homecoming. <laughs> no. No. Call, 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 call it whatever. The proof's in the pudding. <laughs> Well, I said, and so, um, and so, and so, we're we gonna have welcome home Sunday. Um, um, so, so what's that gonna mean? We're just gonna create an opportunity for people to invite lost people to come and be found in Christ. So, so, so what? So what does that look like? Just invite cars. Just building up the energy. Just creating momentum. We're gonna have this one day where we're all where we're all gonna flood the room. Watch this. And some of you knew you were muddy, and you walked in, leaving a track of where you came from and you were preparing your speech that if a prophet speaks to me today, then I'm just going to give this speech of guilt and shame. But what you didn't know is before you ever walked in this room 10 weeks ago, we were already coming for you. Before you ever got close to us, we had already started making our way back to you. And why is this important? What does this mean to you? Somebody say, welcome home. It means to you the same thing that his father did. He said to his servants, quick, bring out the best robe. I'm doing my good preaching today. Bring out the best robe, all right? So, 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 so why are we going to bring out the best robe? We, we're going to bring out the best robe for two reasons. All right. Oh, man, I don't know how to say this. Um, we're going to bring out the best robe for two reasons. Number one, because everybody needs to know. They already know where you came from but they need to know who you're rolling with. Yes. All right, that's the uh, King James translation. Here's the PTV version, all right? And um, so in your house, who has the best robe? 
mom and dad. Whoever, see, I knew that feminism was going to come out. Nah, man. Huh? I'm tell Saint what you said. You better get him a polo robe by the time you get home or it's going down. <laughs> the person in a position of power has the best robe. So he says, get the best robe and put them on. Because I need everybody before they even open their mouth and start putting their words on my son. I need them to know despite what he did, he belongs to me. And today's your day. Welcome home, by the way. We're not concerned with where you came from. We're not concerned with what you did. Somebody get the best role and cover them now. So, because on your arm, they might be a mark from a needle. On your arm, they could be a mark from where you've been cutting. On your body, they could be marks of activities of your life. But when we clothe you in the robe, we cover your past and help to us you in your new future. He says, number two, I need you to get the ring, all right? Ring, why are we gonna get the ring, all right? And that day, the ring was used as a signet. Whenever you did a letter, you would dip it in ink and you would use that ring and put a signet to make it official. It means although you left, power now belongs to you again. And God is saying, I'm restoring it to somebody, the power that you once had. The power that comes down your line. Your grandma prayed with power. Your grandfather walked in power. And somebody said power skipped you, but it was only for a season. Your power is coming back. He says, get the robe. Get the ring, get the sandals, all right? Yeah, get the sandals, get the Yeezys. Put the, Ye put the Yeezys on. You're going to put the Jesus? You're going to put the Yeezys on them? Put the Yeezys on them, right? Because the whole while he was walking from where he was to where he is now, we can look back and see the tracks that were left. Because he took a journey through the mud. But if you want to learn how to cover your tracks, you put something on your feet. Those who were the lowliest other day walked around barefoot, but those in power had something on their feet. He says, I'm restoring you your place, I'm restoring you your power, and I'm removing all guilt and shame. You with me now. Now, if we might as well finish the story, the story also says that there was another brother who was in the house who then looked at his father like, what? So we throwing parties now? <laughs> I mean, I done turned 16 three times, like nobody throwing me, we just throwing parties now? I said, yeah, your, your brother who is dead has come back to life. Happy birthday, by the way. Your brother who was dead has not come, this party was for him! But I ain't never do that. And you never threw me a party. Because you've always been in the house, Everything I have belonged to you. But you never asked. You are now experiencing some heart issues because you think what somebody is benefiting from is better when you could have had the same thing times over had you just asked. You jealous over friends because they get married, but when people ask you about your relationship status, I don't need no man. You don't need no man, but you always pregnant. I'm confused. I'm sorry. I don't know how they do that. How they do that though? I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Here's a problem, then I'm gonna leave you alone. <clears throat> the problem is what's coming out your mouth is not what's in your heart. What's coming out of your mouth is what was fed into your ears. Because of your mother's pain, she's put that in you. I don't need no man. Because your auntie's pain, she's put that in you. You don't need no man. You want a man. You just want a good one. And you got to learn how to say what it is, what you want. Lord, don't send me no mess. I don't want nobody sloppy seconds or leftovers. I'm a grown woman, don't send me no boys. Give me something on my level or leave me alone. Ain't got time to be playing. I don't know where that came from. I don't even know how to transition at this point. Near the cross, near the cross. Be my glory ever. I don't.
I don't know. Stand to your feet all across the room. Welcome home, fam. Why is this important? If nothing else, I hope that you get to see that as Christians, we don't live miserable lives. If you can't tell, I'm having a good time. And this is all a part of my calling and the assignment that the Lord's placed on my life. My wife and I, we have good time. I don't know what church you come from. My wife and I dance in the right setting. We dance. I don't know if I'm supposed to tell you this. And we don't do it the Bobby Jones gospel. <laughs> that new Tyrese is fire, by the way. You understand? Now, I done opened that can of worms, so let me give some balance, then I'm going to leave you alone. I don't believe as Christians we should live sloppy lives, but I do believe as Christians that there ought to be an overwhelming sense of joy and love that we can benefit through this thing called life when we do it God's way. My parents made me come to church when I was younger, and I hated it, but today I'm thankful for it because they had, walking me, they had me walking in God's way, but I wasn't walking in it. They were pushing me through it. But I am thankful for the push. <clears throat> because of their push, there's some experiences that they had. And because of their push, there's some experiences that some of you have had. But through that push, there are experiences I never had. So there are pleasures of this thing called life, even as a Christian, that I believe I can enjoy. And I have a great time doing them. You understand what I'm saying? Oh, I, God, I don't know. All right, so let's, look, let's do it this way. All right? So everybody's, everybody's seen, you've seen the trumpet, right? So imagine the trumpet. Here's the, here's the horn end, and here's the mouthpiece. The horn end is really wide. On this end is the mouthpiece. It's really small. This is life for a believer. How you live is contingent upon which direction you go in first. So if you go in through the wide horn and live lives of liberty at a young age, you will lack discipline. And the older you get, you have to live with more restraints because you started out more loosely. But I'm so thankful for the way my parents raised me that they forced me through, through the mouth, forced me through rigidness. But because I started with this forced discipline, I can now open up to more of the liberties that don't contaminate me like it might contaminate others who came through the wider end. That's what I mean about this thing called Christ. It's more than just fire insurance. This is about changing the way that you see the world. Amen. Amen. Somebody got my parents a cruise on Carnival. <laughs> my, pa my parents didn't know. We like, yo, I don't think you want that smoke. Well, it's going to be all right, bruh. You ain't built for carnival. You understand? <laughs> but you can transfer it to me and my wife, though. <laughs> that might have you going back. But it's going to have me going forward. Higher in Jesus. <laughs> Father, I'm so thankful for this time we've been able to spend today, and I pray your blessings upon these, your people. Keep and cover them in only the way that you can. We give you praise and thanks. In Jesus' name, we pray. If you're here today, look at me if you don't mind. We've been praying for you over the last 10 to 8 weeks. This is not a game. You understand? I didn't come just for a good word and just for some music. We came to see lives change and people make decisions for Christ. We're not going to force you. This is not about our ego. This is about the transformation. If you start today, imagine how much further along you can be by this time next year. Anybody ever had a friend y'all was going to do a diet together? And then like two weeks, did I, am I prophesying? She was like, ah. Oh. And, then, and then like two weeks in, you cut out. And then 12 weeks later, you see them all snatched like, ah. Oh. Had I just stayed with it? I'm telling you, if you just start this journey and stay with it, you will see transformation in your life. 
I look at my hands, my hands look new. I look at my feet and they did too. And all that is beautiful. But before he changed your feet, I'm asking God, change their heart. Change our hearts. Change our minds. Change the way we see life so we can experience more of what you have for us. If you're here today and you feel like you were talking to me today, you don't know Jesus, but you want to know him. You knew him, but you walked away. You know him, but you want to know him in a better way. Pastor T, you were talking to me today. Or number five, I need a place like this that I can call home. Like y'all a wily bunch. This is my type of people over here. All right? Almost like Colorado. We coming, you understand? We coming. All right? So if you're here today, you fit any of those five bills. I don't know Jesus, but I want to know him. I knew him, but I walked away. I know him, but I want to know him in a better way. You were talking to me today, Pastor T, or number five. I want to be a part.